116th Coffee and Conversation. Uh, and this is the last one for this year. But we're already laying out our plans for next year. And to just give you a quick highlight, our first co Coffee and Conversation for 2022 will not be the second, uh, second Saturday of the month, but will be the fourth. We're going to take a slight little break. And our speaker there will be Gail Beaton, uh, actually a good friend of Flint Whitlock's, uh, who's on our board, and will speak about uh, Colorado women in World War II. And there's some fantastic stories about that. Our next one will be then uh, the February 19th. And actually, our speaker is here today, Doug Nunes. Doug, raise your hand in the back. Doug served in Vietnam and stuff, but his talk is going to be about his father, who was a P-47 pilot during World War II. Uh, and Doug actually has combat films, gun, gun, what do you, camera shots of his, taken by his father during these many flights. And the P-47 was a major fighter, uh, primarily in Western, well, in Europe uh, and stuff. So that will be kind of the beginning, and I already have quite a few names and volunteers who would love to tell their story as well. Uh, also, I'd like to kind of highlight, we have some famous authors in our midst today. One of them sitting right up front here, David Barrett. David, raise your hand. David uh, recently wrote a book, which has just gone wildfire, called 140 Days to Hiroshima and actually gave us a great talk here this fall about it and has been on the speaker circuit quite a bit lately to a bunch of famous places, World War II Museum and, and all that stuff, uh, talking about that. Again, if you're interested in knowing kind of how the war ended in the Pacific, and again, I like the way he did it because there have been some other excellent books which are more just historical but this is basically a countdown. And what were some of the key decisions that were made or not made by both the Japanese hierarchy and our own, which led to, fortunately, the quick end to the war. Uh, Don Saigon, who's going to be one of our speakers today, too, is an author uh, and a speaker here, and has written, uh, I think, several books. But the one I've really enjoyed was the one about the Battle of Bulge. And what did you call that again? It was no silent, no silent Night. And we'll get him back this coming year as well to do that. So, uh, well, and Jerry Gavaldon, uh, not necessarily an author, but a master modeler. Uh, and the marvelous model we have upstairs uh, is one that he's built. And we've had many others here, both he and Kent Strapko, wherever Kent is. Uh, well, he's here today. You're talking about the Arizona. Yeah, well, this is the Arizona. But uh, they're just amazing, the models we've had. Uh, so anyway, I think that's kind of, oh, excuse me, did John? Flint. Yeah, but I did, oh, there he is. Okay, Flint Whitlock, gentleman with the gray hair. Actually, looks pretty young, uh, standing in the hallway. And Flint's got pr probably three or four major books. Uh, and recently, what was the award? Oh, he's got ten, fifteen. Jeez. But anyway, and also received a major award in recognition as what Colorado Authors Hall of Fame. Yeah. Boy, talk. Oh. But anyway. Okay. But anyway, we have quite, yes. But I would like to mention uh. that uh, those of you who have or will see our Pearl Harbor exhibit, you'll see a little bit of Pete Peterson up there, who mm -hmm. was a survivor of the West Virginia. His grandson is here today. Oh. And so he'll be coming in here very shortly. Oh. Great. And he was on uh, Oklahoma, was it? Oh, West Virginia. Oh, West Virginia. Right. That was right. OK. Well, this is quite a day. A great way to kind of end the year, uh, although the topic. Uh, again, the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. 
Uh, and obviously it totally changed everything uh, within our country. Oh yeah, let's get that door. Uh, and maybe just before we get going, uh, do any of you have any recollection of what your parents might have said? Or in a couple cases, I believe, sir, you might have been a young boy during that period. Do you recall how you learned about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Yeah. Well, I, did. I was nine years old when it happened. I was standing on the sidewalk in Indiana. And, you know, the whole town was so small, but they just went chaotic. It was just terrible. So that's the only thing I have remember about it. Yeah, anyone else would like to just add something? This is Pete Peterson's grandson here. Oh, Two of them actually. oh hello. <laughs> oh, great. No, well, welcome. Thanks for doing this, David. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Lou. Yeah, I was actually five years old. I, my uncle, who was uh, 17, I think, at the time, was babysitting me, if you will. We were walking around the block in Mars, Iowa. The lady came out of the house screaming and crying. I didn't understand what it was all about. But that was what was all about. She had just heard the Japanese at um, uh, Pearl Harbor. I don't remember anything on either side of that, but I remember the lady coming out of the house mm. screaming and crying. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I can imagine. Uh, well, if we don't have any others, let's just kind of set the stage again. Remind ourselves what this was all about. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation. And at solicitation of Japan, still in conversation with its government and its emperor, looking toward the maintenance of peace yeah, in the Pacific. John. Indeed, one hour after, Japanese air squadrons had commenced bombing in the American island of Oahu, the Japanese ambassador to the United States and his colleagues delivered to our Secretary of State a formal reply to a recent American message. While this reply stated that it seemed useless to continue the existing diplomatic negotiation. It contained no threat or hint of war or of armed attack. It will be recorded that the distance of Hawaii from Japan makes it obvious that the attack was deliberately planned many days or even weeks ago. During the intervening time, the Japanese government has deliberately sought to deceive the United States by false statements and expressions of hope for continued peace. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. In addition, American ships have been reported torpedoed on the high seas between San Francisco and Honolulu. Yesterday, the Japanese government also launched an attack 
against Malaya. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Hong Kong. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Guam. Last night, Japanese forces attacked the Philippine Islands. Last night, the Japanese attacked Wu Island. And this morning, the Japanese attacked Midway Island. Japan has therefore undertaken a surprise offensive extending throughout the Pacific area. The facts of yesterday and today speak for themselves. The people of the United States have already formed their opinions and well understand the implications for the very life and safety of our nation. As Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, I have directed that all measures be taken for our defense. But always, will our whole nation remember the character of the onslaught against us. So what actually happened? Obviously, it was a catastrophic you know, attack uh, on our country, and it totally changed us. But what we did see, you know, four Navy battleships were sunk and four severely damaged. Three cruisers, three destroyers, an anti-aircraft training ship, and a mine layer were sunk or damaged. 188 aircraft destroyed, 153 damaged. 2,402 Americans killed, an additional 1,282 wounded, and U.S. reluctance to enter World War II completely vanished. Well, what kind of led us up to that point? Uh, it wasn't something that suddenly occurred overnight. Uh, actually, if you kind of go back, uh, it was pretty evident we probably were going to be on a collision course with the Japanese at some point. And this really even goes back to uh, 1931. 
uh, back in that area, you know, we saw the expansion of Japan into Manchuria. Uh, the expansion further uh, Korea, which at that time uh, was uh, kind of came under Japanese control. Uh, and then even all the way up through, you know, 39, whoops, yeah, yep, yeah. Uh, what we ended up seeing was that the expansion into Manchuria was bringing them in conflict with the Russians. Uh, and that was what you ended up seeing within the Japanese military. There was kind of a, a dichotomy. The army viewed that they needed to expand into China and Manchuria and maybe even the Siberia for them to get the, the resources they really needed. Uh, very quickly, around 37, uh, they became very much involved in expansion into China. Uh, but the Navy had a different view. Their view was the main resources which they needed, coal, tin, iron, um, and above all oil, could also be obtained for them down in the southern region. So there was kind of this battle between both of them until uh, uh, really about 1939, where the Soviets, in a major battle up along the, along the Mongolian border, uh, I keep always remember, forgetting how to pronounce the name, Kolgan Gore, well, something like that, uh, actually bloodied the Japanese significantly. And at that point, they kind of realized that's probably not going to be the way to go. Plus, at that time, they very much were bog getting bogged down in China. So at that point, the issue of expansion to the further south to get the resources pretty much were there. Uh, fortunately, right around, well, in 41, uh, well, between 39 to 41, they were able to uh, negotiate a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union. And particularly once the Germans attacked the Russians, uh, the Japanese could be pretty certain that there's not going to be any major action or threat from the Soviets in that area. Uh, but for them to expand down into this area, the biggest concern was the, the major well, let's see, track for all the resources to come back to Japan, which they would need, would be bypassing right along the Philippine Islands. And that would have posed a major threat to their vital line of uh, resources. That could be actually neutralized uh, if, you know, they could take some action that would more or less neutralize our fleet for, uh, for at least a, a significant period of time. The overall design for them was, in the southern expansion, was to move in, seize the resources of this area, at the same time fortify an outer ring of islands, which they actually already had a control of as a result of the end of World War I. The Marshalls, the uh, Carolyn, and the Mariana Islands, at that point, all belonged to the Japanese. And their concept for the major defense, what they're doing, was with the idea by fortifying an outer ring here, at some point, if the American fleet came toward them, uh, they would gradually weaken the fleet with attacks by submarines, air power, and everything, such that at some point they would have the, ma the major decisive naval battle. Uh, this is kind of the theory of uh, Alfred Mahan, uh, American uh, naval theorist. And so that was the overall kind of concept for this. Uh, but the question was, if you're going to do this, uh, where is going to be the American fleet? Well, major challenges they had was they knew where the fleet was. Uh, President Roosevelt had essentially moved a significant part of our Pacific fleet from the west coast to Pearl Harbor. 
but that's over 4,000 miles away. Uh, you still had to, if you're going to attack it, had to amass a significant amount of sufficient naval and air power to attach such a large harbor. And you also needed to come up with some new type of weapons for armor penetrating bombs and shallow water torpedoes. Generally, the thought has been, up until that point in time, it's almost impossible to attack a fleet anchored in a harbor area, particularly if the water's very shallow. But lo and behold, in 1940, uh, in November, the British did exactly that and essentially took out uh, the Italian major com elements of their fleet, which were anchored in a shallow harbor in Toronto, which was kind of at the base of the boot uh, of Italy. And what did they do it with? 21 ferry, 21 ferry swordfish airplanes. I mean, these essentially were obsolete by the beginning of World War II. Could fly at about 120 miles an hour. Uh, basically, uh, the wings and everything were cloth and dope covered. Uh, but they could carry uh, torpedoes. And not only that, the training had allowed them to learn how to do night attacks and landing on, on aircraft carriers. In fact, you know, during much of the early war, uh, the British were the major ones with advances in learning how to do naval aviation operations. Well, lo and behold, uh, in two waves in a night attack, uh, they carried out a very successful attack on the Italian fleet and essentially took it off the table from being a significant uh, uh, factor in the threat to Malta and the Mediterranean. Uh, and guess what? The Japanese were very interested in that. In fact, they sent some of their naval officers, in fact, to include uh, uh, Genda, who will show up later, to come out and study this further. And it was the experience of the British demonstrating what could be done, which actually finally helped convince, again, Yamamoto, uh, being the, the major architect for this, but with the experience the British had in the success of the t attack, uh, finally convinced uh, the senior staff within the Japanese military that such an attack on the U.S. Navy fleet could be feasible. Commander Minoru Genta was the air staff officer who really had tremendous experience with Navy aviation and, and how to coordinate attacks. And essentially, he's kind of the main genius behind devising the attack onto Pearl Harbor. Uh, Yamamoto, again, uh, a fascinating figure, uh, actually had, a, had grown up in a, you know, a, a poor family. Uh, was recognized for having <coughs> tremendous capabilities and later on was adopted into the Yamamoto family, which was a samurai much more higher uh, respected. Uh, and again, to demonstrate a, you know, exceptional capabilities to do things. Uh, Nagumo was commander for the carrier attack force, which eventually uh, uh, was put together, uh, and his name shows up uh, several times again later in the war. So the key thing they had to figure out was really what the heck to do and, and how to kind of pull together the sufficient resources to come up with this. And, I mean, they did it. Uh, you know, an uh, exceptional planning team. They pulled all the resources together to the remote location, way up in the Kuril Islands. This is way up in the northernest part of Japan, very isolated. Once, you know, the forces came up there for training, they were cut off from any, any communication back with family or anything. Uh, they did continuous reconnaissance of Pearl Harbor, even create a detailed model of the harbor. And they could readily get that information because in Pearl Harbor, well, in Hawaii, you had a consulate. 
And lo and behold, you know, you could kind of just with binoculars keep track of the comings and goings. Uh, and again, with any military exercise, you know, once you've created a plan, if you don't practice it time and again, uh, things will invariably go wrong. And they low and help develop some armor-piercing bombs, essentially 16-inch naval shells with fins. Uh, and then torpedoes, well, they kind of followed what the British did. Uh, they put on some wooden fins and, and structures on the back, which just helped keep the keep the torpedoes from diving deep once you dropped them. Uh, and then, of course, attack when the enemy least expected. Now, that's characteristic of the success of the Japanese, certainly with respect to their uh, experience fighting the Russians. Uh, they attacked at night uh, a, a Russian fleet, what there was at Port Arthur, uh, with torpedoes and just a surprise attack and essentially decimated them. Uh, so it wasn't as if you didn't know something could be brewing or they would have the capability to do this. So again, you know, they have significant strike force put together six fleet carriers. We only had three operational in the Pacific kind of at that time. And the Japanese at that point had 10. Uh, and they probably would have had two more except uh, after the Battle of the Coral Sea. Well, no, it wasn't that. That was Midway. Uh, well, they had the other carriers were off getting ready to support the move into the uh, South Asia area. Uh, but it was significant. And so anyway, at this point, I'd like to pass it on to our second speaker here, Don. And let me just hook you up, since we only have one of these that seems to be working. Sure. And I'm going to go over this map board that you all see right here. And if some of you cannot see the map board at this point, um, I invite you to come up after we're done talking. And we'll also end up showing a picture of it up on the screen up there. Yeah. So, so here's this for you to move thank you, forward. Sir. Um, and uh, something about, you know what um, Mike was talking about here, the Japanese had done some of the most extensive planning. Their doctrine, their training of their pilots and everything was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, I don't admire, as an American, I don't admire what happened on December 7th, but you have to have some admiration for how the Japanese put this together. And throughout the course of the war, they never again would have this level, and, and to be quite honest, this time period, in order for them to put together this attack in the way that they did, down to the minuscule detail. Uh, Japanese naval aviation was head and shoulders above any other nation at this time. Uh, the United States, we would catch up very quickly. But at this time, in 1941, Japanese naval aviation was supreme. Uh, and part of it was not just the ships that they had and their naval crew, but it was their naval aviators who were very intensely trained, and also the aircraft that they had. They had a perfect trio combination of three aircraft here that very soon most other nations would start to adopt this, this whole type of plan. Uh, a dive bomber, a high altitude bomber or torpedo bomber, and then of course some of you know the infamous Zero fighter, which was probably the best fighter of its time, uh, maybe with the exception of the Spitfire at this time period in history. So I have these little models of each one of these aircraft up here. Uh, so you can kind of see how the trio went together. Uh, the Zero Fighter, we have the Aichi 99, Type 99 dive bomber, the Vowel dive bomber. The Americans gave them these code names based. The fighters had a male name, and the bombers would have a female name. So. For the Japanese torpedo bomber, it was called the Kate. And the, you'll hear me refer to Zero, Val, Kate, maybe here when I start talking about uh, the attack. So this was uh, one of those weapons that they had in the uh, arrow that they had in their quiver, so to speak. 
that was going to pay dividends during this attack. And for a large part of the war, up through 1942, uh, these planes were still quite effective, especially the Zero. And it was only later that the United States started to get aircraft that could match these. Uh, because at this time period, we had, um, well, with the exception of our dive bomber, our naval aircraft, our torpedo bomber, was, which was called the Devastator, was pretty hopeless. And we had the uh, old F-4F Wildcat fighter, which was durable, but still rather slow. All right, so moving on. And I'll tell you a little story about this. There we go. Uh, the model map that I have here before I get to this. I use this when I teach my classes over at Red Rocks Community College. And what's interesting about it is I find that so many young people really don't know exactly what occurred here at Pearl Harbor, uh, including some people who have visited Pearl Harbor, who have been to Oahu and have gone there. Uh, they said, well, I remember going there when I was 12 years old with my family. But I really didn't understand anything. You know, we saw the Arizona Memorial and this and that. Uh, and then one day I was sitting there, I took this thing out, and I was explaining it to my students, and I was showing them how the attack kind of played out here. And I have a little launch down here. I'll show it to you later. And the launch represents the little boat, the little launch, that takes tourists today across to Ford Island and over to see the Arizona Memorial. And I had this one student, and I, and I teach a lot of veterans, a lot of these young veterans that have served in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I had this one young man, and he sits and he goes, oh, I'm very familiar with that. And I said, really? And he goes, oh, yeah, I know this whole area and everything. And I said, have you visited there? He goes, well, better than that, he said, I was, um, and pardon me, I'm not a naval specialist. I was a coxswain. Is that the term? Co Navy? Co coxswain. OK. So I was a coxswain on board that little launch. He said, that's what I did during my time period in the Navy. I took visitors over to see the Arizona Memorial. So he was pretty familiar with it, as you can imagine. Um, anyway, getting back to this approach to Hawaii here, the Japanese had been keeping very careful radio silence during this time. And they get all the way to this point where they finally get the message from Japan that they are to go through with this attack. And they launch in two waves early on the morning of December 7th. And this map model here represents what Pearl Harbor looked like, the area around Ford Island, about 7 o'clock, 0700 hours on December 7th. Okay? And we know that nothing would ever be the same after this point, so it's kind of frozen in time. And what I do is I manipulate all the little pieces around here for my students so they understand what ships were hit, what ships were sunk, where the Japanese came, and all this kind of stuff. But I want people to understand this only represents a rather focused, small part of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, there were many other attacks. Of course, there were attacks on uh, you know, uh, Hickam Field, Wheeler Field, uh, Kanawe, and areas like this. So uh, that does not that's not really represented on here because you have to kind of narrow it down to a certain scale so you can take a look at it. But most of us are familiar with the story of the battleships in the Arizona and everything. And so that's why I kind of created this model around Battleship Row and what occurred at uh, Ford Island on that morning. And when we get to the Arizona, I'll, I'll turn it over to Jerry, and he's going to tell you a lot more about specifically what happened to that ship because that was the largest number of casualties during this attack were on board the Arizona. Okay, so where did I put that little thing again? There it is. Um, when they launched, the Japanese launched this first wave, and there were two waves that were launched of aircraft. And the very first wave, as they are coming in early in the morning, and some of you may know this story, there is a radar station that's up here at Opana, and remember that radar was a relatively new technology for the US military at this time. Uh, there were two capable operators who were enlisted men who were running this radar station early that morning. And they see this huge blurb on the radar screen. And they start saying, well, that's got to be some sort of incoming aircraft, some sort of uh, huge number of aircraft coming in. And they did their duty. They went ahead and called their uh, commanding officer, Lieutenant Kermit Tyler, who the poor guy has gotten a bad rep, undeservedly so. 
Uh, and they tell him, you know, we see something coming in here. We're not exactly sure what it is, but it looks like a large force of aircraft, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And Tyler told him, yeah, you know, don't worry about it. And that has oftentimes gone down as being, you know, oh, Tyler was incompetent. He didn't do anything. He was lazy or whatever. And in reality, Tyler knew ahead of time that there was a fleet or a, a wing of six B-17 aircraft that were flying in from the mainland that morning. And they were expected to fly into uh, Pearl Harbor. And so he knew that, but he couldn't tell these enlisted men that because that was top secret. So he just kind of told them, don't worry about it. In other words, what he was really saying is, those are probably the B-17s. Unfortunately, as we know, they weren't. Okay, that was the very first attack wave that was coming in. So those two enlisted men kind of shut down the mobile radar station, and that was that. Uh, when this force comes in, the uh, commander of the first strike wing, um, Mitsu Fuchida, He's an interesting guy. If you ever read any of the accounts about him, uh, later on, he tells all kinds of information about the Battle of Midway, about Pearl Harbor, to American intelligence officers after the war. You know, he was lucky enough to survive the war. Uh, but at this point, he's in, he's in charge. He's in command of this flight that's coming in. And he sort of screws up. As much as we'd like to think that the Japanese had done extensive preparation for this, uh, Fuchida kind of messes things up a little bit, although it doesn't really matter in the end result. Uh, when he gets to this point, about 10 minutes or so outside of the island of Oahu, and are coming in from the north here like this, he goes ahead and issues the command, or he's, he says the code signal, to, 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 which basically meant, you know, we've sighted, we're coming in on Oahu. And then as they start flying in through the northern part here, um, his orders are that he's supposed to fire off a single flare from the cockpit to notify the rest of the Japanese pilots that basically the Americans are caught sleeping. They're unaware. There's no you know, anti-aircraft up. There's no uh, enemy aircraft that are, in, are present to intercept us and to begin the attack. And the idea was there was that the torpedo bombers were supposed to go in first, these Kate torpedo bombers like this. They were supposed to drop down. They were slightly slower aircraft. And obviously, for a torpedo bomber, you're going to want to get down low to the water uh, to release your torpedo. So they had to start decreasing their altitude as soon as possible. Now he fires off this flare, and he doesn't see anything going on. Two flares he was going to fire off were going to be the signal that basically the Americans knew what was going on. They were aware. And so there was kind of a different plan there. And that was that the dive bombers were going to go in first. And they were going to go like that. Uh, so he's waiting. And he does kind of a stupid thing. Instead of just, he couldn't break radio communication. But instead of doing anything else signaling his group, he fires a second flare. And so now all of the other aircraft pilots see this as a signal that, uh-oh, the Americans know we're coming. And so it changes the whole game plan. The Japanese torpedo bombers are already descending, and all of a sudden, these VAL dive bombers like this start coming down on top of them. And there's even a couple of counts where there are almost some collisions. And so at this point, Fuchita's like, oh, well, everything's screwed up. Let's just go in and attack. You know, there's, there's... And it, as it was, it didn't really matter in the, in the end run, but it's just kind of interesting when uh, we take a look at how the attack could have come out and where it could have gone. Um, as they come into Pearl Harbor, and you'll notice Pearl Harbor here is the southern part of Oahu, and you'll see Ford Island there. Okay, and here's the model. Some of you know this story too, and I'll, I'll let maybe some other folks, again, the, the PTO, the Pacific Theater of Operations, especially the Naval Operations, is not really my wheelhouse. I'm more of kind of an ETO guy. Uh, but from what I do know, uh, there was a tug that was outside the channel of Pearl Harbor this time, the Condor. And as it was going into Pearl Harbor, they had a um, submarine net there in front of the, the entrance to the harbor to keep you know subs out. And as it was starting to go through there, there was a little opening. Um, 
it radios that it sees a Japanese periscope or an enemy periscope of some sort of submarine. And some of you know the story. There is a destroyer on duty out there. And it was the, um, the ward, I think, right? Yeah. And uh, the destroyer, I think it was a Naval Reserve officer, his first command, uh, outer bridge. He sees this sub, and they went ahead and attacked it, and they, they sunk this sub. So it's interesting to know that before any of the aircraft even get into Pearl Harbor, the Japanese aircraft, and attack, the United States actually kind of fired the very first shots mm -hmm. in the war. And they sunk this, this sub, which they had the right to do, of course. It's an enemy sub. It hasn't identified itself. It represented a threat. And they go ahead and, and perforate this thing and send it to the bottom. And there were a couple of these midget submarines, as Mike had mentioned, um, that played a certain role in this battle. There's still some question as to what role they played, because they were all sunk. And uh, almost all the crews, except for one Japanese ensign, yeah, Sakamaki, they were, they were all killed. Uh, except him, he was captured. Uh, he was the first Japanese prisoner of war. How would you like that distinction if you were Japanese? <laughs> I'm the first guy caught, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but as they start to come in here, and they start to uh, split up, as we said, these dive bombers came down first. And the dive bombers hit the um, air station over here, which has a bunch of these flying boats, these PBY aircraft here on this ramp. And that kind of clued the Americans in. Because the, the radio communication from the ward had somehow gotten screwed up and had not gone in that they had sighted an enemy submarine at this time. So that wouldn't come in for almost an entire hour. Otherwise, that might have given them a little bit of a, a jump start warning. Uh, but the first warning they actually do get is when these Val dive bombers come in here and they start bombing this little seaplane area here, the hangars and everything like that, some of these first bombs hit there before the torpedo bombers even uh, come in. The torpedo bombers split into two groups. One comes in and hits this part and these ships here. And this is, oh, by the way, the orientation here, I apologize. This is north, this direction. That is south. That's out the channel there. That would go out the channel to the Pacific Ocean. And of course, you know, here you have east, west. So as they come in, these torpedo bombers split up. Part of them hits this area and targets these ships. And the other part flies around the dive bombers here and comes in. And they were trained to go ahead and come in this direction. Now, it's interesting. If you've been to Pearl Harbor, uh, this area right here, which I can't really reproduce on the map board because it's off the map board this direction, it is this east lock which is this almost like a bowling alley that directs you straight into Battleship Row right here. So this was the perfect setup for these torpedo bombers. They had all the time in the world to skim over the water, to sight in on these ships here, and release their torpedoes and hit them. It was almost like ducks in a shooting gallery. And as they come in, they hit sort of here and here, and it's about, if I recall, close to 8 o'clock in the morning when those first torpedoes start to hit. Um, up here, they primarily target, and I don't have the ship here in the photo, but you'll see it on the board here. They primarily target this old battle wagon, old American battleship, the Utah. And the Utah is being used as a sort of a training ship for dive bomber pilots, American dive bomber pilots. They have all these huge uh, planks of decking on there. And the dive bomber pilots in those days would usually drop practice bombs that were loaded with flour or paint. So they could see where they hit, right? They could see where they, they hit on board these little boards. Uh, as they come in, these torpedo bombers, and there's been some confusion about this, and there's. The story is supposedly the Japanese thought it might be an aircraft carrier. Remember, the Japanese are looking for aircraft carriers as their priority, their primary target. They want to sink American aircraft carriers. So there's some thought they might have mistaken it for an aircraft carrier. Although, at the same time, the Japanese are just going to hit any big ship. And Utah, even though it's antiquated, is still a big ship. So they focus most of their torpedoes on that ship very quickly 
uh, it sinks cap sizes. And I have these little markers that I use up here to kind of show the ship having cap size. If you can see that. If you go there today, you can still see the remains of the U-top. It's still there. Um, and that ship was, did not have a huge crew on board since it was a training ship. I think it had about 40? 58. 58, yeah. Yeah, but most of them were killed, if I understand. So it was uh, pretty tragic, even though. 58 were killed, but don't know the complement. Yeah, I don't think it was a whole lot more than that, no. though. Yeah, yeah. So then, um, many more of these ships are getting uh, targeted here, the cruisers and everything. But this group that comes around here of torpedo planes, like I said, they had the perfect you know, kind of aiming point here to come down this, this east lock and release their torpedoes. And the outboard battleships that you see, the ones that are on the outboard side of Ford Island there, were the ones that were hit the hardest by torpedoes. Obviously, the inboard battleship, the little sister battleships that are in the inside, are not going to be hit by the torpedoes. And very quickly, um, the West Virginia, the Oklahoma, uh, tragically, of course, the Oklahoma is, is perforated so badly that it also capsizes very quickly. So I kind of replaced that with a little capsize hole there. And then with this little thing, I like to put all the, the oil spilling out. As you can imagine, there was a lot of oil coming out of there. And that's what happens there with the torpedo bombers. The torpedo bombers were uh, very effective in this first wave. Uh, some of the best torpedo hits that the Japanese would have in any battle, Midway, Coral Sea, uh, any of these, was here at Pearl Harbor. And we can say a large part of that was not just because of the layout and the training and everything, but also because there wasn't a whole lot of anti-aircraft yet. You know, It took a while for the Americans to react, although they did react pretty quick, quicker than we sometimes give them credit for, and start firing back. So they start hitting these. They, they capsize the Oklahoma. Uh, they hit the West Virginia. The West Virginia is sinking. And the other thing, too, before I get to uh, the Arizona, which, like I said, I'll leave to, to Jerry, is that this whole Japanese attack went down, as we said, almost perfectly. But the Americans had three huge strokes of luck. Uh, one of the biggest ones was we had no aircraft carriers in port that day. They were all out. The Lexington was on its way to Midway. The Enterprise was coming back from Wake Island, delivering aircraft there. And so that was a godsend, that uh, none of our aircraft carriers were trapped in the port uh, at that time. We're in Pearl Harbor and got hit. They were all out to sea. Um, I believe the Lexington, well, the Lexington was delivering aircraft. The Saratoga was on the West Coast. Interestingly enough, the battleship Colorado, the namesake right, of our state, was supposed to be at Pearl Harbor, but was on the West Coast also getting repaired. So, yeah, yeah. So we were lucky that you know we didn't lose the entire uh, fleet, especially our naval air capacity here uh, during this attack. There's a blow up picture of that again. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So, and then the second point of luck we had has to do with these fuel yards that are over here, these fuel tanks, aviation, diesel fuel. Remember, not all the ships were steam powered at this time. And the Japanese did not really focus on there. They did not really attack those. If they had hit all those gas tanks, you can imagine how those would have just gone up like firecrackers. And then the Pacific Fleet and the aircraft and everything would have had a difficulty getting fuel back to Pearl Harbor. Uh, probably the only good fuel stations would have been the West Coast that they would have been able to rely on the ships and, and aircraft. And think of how that would have you know, set us back during war. And then finally, the third part was that the Japanese seemed to also have ignored the um, naval repair yards here at 1010 Pier. And on this part right here, you had dry docks, you had repair facilities, and so, of course, with those being untouched for the most part, um, when this attack is over, we're able to repair a lot of these damaged ships. Uh, so most of these ships were put back into service for the war, uh, with the exception, of course, the Oklahoma, the Utah, and the Arizona. Okay. Now, um, that's kind of in a nutshell. There was obviously a whole lot here 
other things going on, especially during the second wave. But I do want to give Jerry a chance here to talk a little bit about the Arizona. And remember that some of these bombers, these Kate torpedo planes, were also outfitted with those artillery shell bombs that Mike was talking about for armor piercing. And they were high level bombers. So a, a group of those was flying over at this time, almost straight down battleship row like this. And when they target the Arizona, we'll kind of turn that over to, to Jerry to tell us a little bit about. So did I see a question back there though, real yeah, quick, John? Um, it was my understanding that there was a third wave that was called off by Nagumo. And in that third wave, they were supposed to attack the, the uh, fuel farms yeah. and the dry docks. Yeah, and if we recall, remember, Nagumo was very cautious. So that kind of fits his nature. So he was kind of like, yeah, let's, let's kind of cut our losses and, and you know, get out of here with what we've got. Uh, the day went really well, uh, better than what we could have imagined. So yeah. And maybe that was a good choice, because by this time, remember, everything in Pearl Harbor, a lot of the ships had sortied. Uh, they had contacted some of the other um, ships that are out at sea, and they might have intercepted the Japanese fleet and done some damage to them. So. And the, uh, the other point was that uh, the Oklahoma, which turned turtle, which rolled over, was due for a major inspection Monday morning. And in preparation for that, they had opened yeah. all the portholes, all the all the watertight uh, doors, and that uh, significantly uh, contributed to the fact that the yeah. after was here. Yeah. And the, uh, we didn't mention the Nevada. The Nevada was the only battleship that was able to sortie or attempt to sortie. And as it moved out of the channel here, it was just the focus of that second wave dive bombers just plastered it. And the, uh, I don't think it was the captain. I think it was like the lieutenant commander who was in charge because the captain was on shore. But they had steam up because they were supposed to have an inspection. And he actually ran into ground here at Hospital Point because he was afraid that, you know, if the ship sunk in the middle of the harbor, then it would block the harbor for the rest of, you know, for months and months. There's the summary. Yeah, yeah question. In all the uh, things that I've seen over my lifetime about Pearl Harbor, they never mentioned sub pens. Did they ever, did the sub submarine pens exist at that time? I know yeah, they were in 1967, because I was there then. So did they just ignore them? Or did they yeah, they had some of the subs there. I don't think the subs incurred any huge damage. I mean, probably because they're smaller ships. And again, the Japanese were very focused on going after the big stuff. The one thing to add, and he's right, um, <coughs> they also excluded submarine pens because the priority was battleships and carriers. That was a Japanese theory. They didn't think about the submarines. And funny thing is, they were the submarines were the first ones out taking casualties and torpedoing Japanese shipping with unrestricted warfare by a memo of Admiral Nimitz, unrestricted warfare. Later on in history, that would come back and save uh, German Admiral Donitz from uh, being executed because he issued the same order, but he took the same order from Nimitz, just for curiosity on how it saved him. But there's also, I think, in fact, one of Flint's books uh, chronicled, again, the submarine warfare immediately after Pearl Harbor and the frustration our submariners had because they had defective Mark 15 torpedoes. The firing pad. Yeah. No matter what you did, you could yeah, bounce it off them and they just didn't work. But they were being blamed by, you know, the higher ups and particularly the research, the Naval Research Group, saying, oh no, it's their fault. And it wasn't until 43, roughly, that it finally was sorted out. And then our submarine force really went whole hog. I'm assuming our naval aviators were using the same thing. Same thing. Same, same, problem. Problem. Yeah, same problems. Our destroyers, the same thing. Mm -hmm. okay. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate the great detail you provided. I'm Jerry Gavaldon. I'm the one who builds model ships and airplanes. And by the way, with a presentation coming up on the P-47, if anyone, if the museum would like to have on loan, I have a P-47 squadron. So I can loan the P-47s. A whole squadron? Well, I have about three of them. But <laughs> my biggest squadron is a B-17s. I have 15 finished and 26 in the box. That's my favorite airplane. So I got to fly on it many years ago when it was over four columns. I'm an avid model builder along with Ken Strapko. We build and sail radio control model ships. 
I have loaned uh, Colorado here. You may have seen Colorado. Nine foot long. And loaned to Saratoga, which was Kent's yeah. ship, was Lexington. We traded ships, so I had to give him the name back and convert it to Saratoga. <coughs> and I have 55 large model ships. I have three carriers, uh, seven battleships, um, a battle cruiser, uh, eight, heavy, eight cruisers, 16 destroyers, eight submarines, and three PT boats, and blah, 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 and sort of, sort of. And um, the Arizona upstairs is one of mine. I loaned to the museum. It still needs to be finished. I need to get it dark looking as it was, should have been with the white tops. I was supposed to bring Sarah T uh, Hornet, but she's in the van, rolled over on her side, so uh, heavy casualties there, so she's staying in the van for repairs. But I'm mainly going to be talking on the Arizona. And just some statistics on the ship itself. Arizona was launched in 1914. And I'll get on this side here. Arizona was launched in 1914. And surprisingly, the Na Under Secretary of the Navy was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was there during the uh, kill lane and launching. The Arizona was commissioned in 1916. And there's a picture of her in 16 or 17 heading out to World War I. And she was very, uh, pretty much the same shape, but she had a whole different superstructure. Uh, then in 1920, 30, 31, Arizona went into refit, where she came out with uh, the fighting tops and more profound superstructure. Back then, they were very limited superstructure. There was like uh, platforms with canvas sides, not much. But, and then um, President Hoover, Back in those days, presidents can take battleships on cruises. Kennedy had uh, the Royal Yacht. Um, let me see, Roosevelt used Iowa to run around the Pacific Atlantic. But Hoover took Arizona on a two-week cruise. Imagine that. Get your own battleship, about three cruisers and a dozen destroyers. He went on a two-week cruise South America to spread the goodwill of America. And there's some beautiful pictures of him. Uh, Our Admiral Arleigh Burke. Uh, served on the Arizona in the 20s. And there's some neat pictures of him. And if you look at the book upstairs, you'll find that there's the book on the Arizona. There's pictures you'll find of many people on it that throughout the war, Nimitz served, uh, was on board during the handover ceremony. So Arizona was very much a pronounced ship and very popular. In fact, the night of December 6, they had a battle of the bands on the Pacific of the fleet. All the battleships and cruisers had their own bands. Arizona won the Battle of the Bands, and as a reward, the captain, uh, Valkenberg, gave them the, an extra hour of sleep on December 7th. Surprisingly, no one survived. Um, Admiral Isaac Kidd was the uh, flagship uh, admiral, I think it was Battle Group Division One, So he flew the pennant off his main mast. So. What happened at Pearl Harbor, um, this is a good shot of the ship uh, on maneuvers there. Mike, if you can go next slide, please. What they did is they knew war was coming. So they started getting the fleet ready. And so when I build models, or any of us build our ships, we had to pick the date, time, and period of the ship because that's how they were to paint it, equipment installed, and what they look like. My Arizona is more peacetime. I haven't had time to get her into colors upstairs. But this model is pretty representative of what she looked like, except some different colors on it. The uh, red tops on the turrets represented the division that she was part of Battle Group 1. And over the years, buddy models, we didn't know about this stuff because research was very Spartan back then until later on information about how these ships were configured for wartime. So we had to go, I had to go back and repaint my tops. And now I have to put white tops on them. And you learn a lot. And here's an anecdote I'll talk about later, but I'll just give you a heads up. The Navy forgot to pull the barrels off the first turret. When she sunk, when she was sunk, this whole section collapsed three feet into the hull, to the bottom, because that's where the bomb that hit right here hit the magazine and just blew the front apart. 
In fact, there's a crack all the way across here where they broke the ship in half, where she was not repairable and she was written off. But this whole turret collapsed intact with shells and everything to the bottom. It was not to the 1980s they realized, what do you mean three turrets? This ship had four turrets. Where's the fourth turret? They went down to the park service and them and the Navy divers found this turret intact. It's still there today. So, uh, because when the salvage crews went in to work on the ship, they stripped the turrets and put them on Hawaii on the north side, built foundations and whole entire mounts and barbettes because they were expecting an invasion from Japan. So they stripped the ship and all other parts through the ship went off to serve other ships. So, but Arizona took down 1177 men. By the way, um, that was the single most loss of life on one ship ever. Uh, that number was not eclipsed until the towers attacks in 2001. But, um, Jim, and what were, again, the purpose of these tall structures? Oh, the there? fighting tops, they call them um, observation. More observation. If any Navy people have any more to add to it, uh, that's what they were. Now, you saw those big clocks on the front and back? Yeah. They're not clocks. They're range finders. <laughs> yeah. uh, even I learned a lesson right over here. Right over yeah, I learned a lesson. I said, hey, I got some nice clocks. And someone said, say, hey, Jerry, uh, we didn't put clocks on the ship. Okay, <laughs> because I couldn't find a little hand. <laughs> so anyway, we won't say clocks anymore because I'm not going to get uh, thumped over the head because or get penalty. Uh, but Mike, if you go to the next slide, please. <laughs> but what happened when Arizona got hit right here and blew it up, exploded, most of the crew was lost right here. They were practically vaporized. I think Kid was lost. Valkenberg was lost, that was a captain. And the only thing they found of Isaac Kidd was his Navy ring. And um, in fact, now we have the Kidd, USS Kidd. And if you, and I have a model of that too, that's one of my favorite destroyers, the Fletchers. But uh, anyhow, a lot of this was wiped out. And of course, everybody sees a famous picture of the forward structure collapsed on itself. And, um, the ship next to it was a repair ship named Vesto, commanded by um, Cassin Young, who later on served on the San Francisco and was lost in the Battle of Guadalcanal Night Battle, November 12th and 13th. And he has a ship named after him. The model upstairs is Cassin Young, another favorite uh, person I like to read about. But um, after the Arizona was lost, they stripped her down to the base here and took most of the top off. The memorial serves right in here uh, over this area here. And here you can see where they started stripping, you can see the tile floor. That's the galley, that's linoleum. And that's where the galley was. And of course, most of the stuff here, this part is, is gone, is totally collapsed. In fact, if you look at Pearl Har go to Pearl Harbor, um, you can't see anything here because it's mostly gone. Uh, you just probably see a little bit of the barbette here. Here you'll see uh, some um, the barbettes right here. I got to go to Pearl Harbor and enjoyed it, and I got to climb over the memorial, which you don't want to do, because I was trying to get a picture of the interior here, and so some Navy person grabbed me and said, I don't think I want to do that. Okay, we won't do that. So just take care. But um, the Arizona is our symbol of uh, the Pearl Harbor, and most kids will know about it. When I was a student teacher, we were watching the Battle of the um, Sink the Bismarck, and I gave an extra credit question. I said, what ship was at the movie last night on TV? You know what I got? Arizona, Titanic, <laughs> uh, Mayflower. I said, and all the females got the question right. They all knew it was Bismarck. But people still get mistaken thinking uh, Arizona was somewhere else. Um, what's important about Arizona is its, so, its significance. And the model here, you'll see, is a good representation. And over the years, the model has evolved with better accuracy and research from people. The model upstairs, you'll see, is probably the most accurate relative of the ship because the research has demonstrated a lot of stuff was um, corrected. 
One thing to note on the Arizona, she was going through some refit at one time. Um, they improved her armament. They put uh, blast shields around the guns. And in the earlier days, they didn't have blast shields. They were just open with, net, with a railing. So they started improving the Arizona, getting her ready for war. Up here, this part was taken off, and there's a little platform like a bird's nest, you know, like a crow's nest or bird bath, a bird bath they call it. They were supposed to put a radar. Was already uh, ordered but not installed because it was not available. They were already putting gun tubs throughout the ship to hold 1.1 machine guns, and they were called Chicago pianos. Um, so America knew war was coming, but Arizona did not get a chance to fulfill her duty. And today, it was just announced about a month ago, two nuclear submarines are being, commit, are, are being named, Arizona and Oklahoma. That's the first time. Where we, did they do range fighting? Was that from up here? I believe so. Any uh, Navy people? Yes, yeah, sir. That, the, the tops no, before radar, so fire control. Fire control. For the big guns, they, they have to be able to see as far as they possibly can to zero in on their target. Very good. You hear it mentioned torpedo blisters quite often in this. What was their purpose? To sort torpedo shock and shell. See, Arizona, if you look right here, you can barely see uh, extension of the lower hull. Arizona's like, the, no offense to ladies, the bottom sag. The ship comes down like this. And now over the side, you have this bulging area underwater. And a lot of that is because the torpedo bulges were added. Otherwise, the ship had a very straight line to the bottom, and then you had the keel. But they started adding the bottom. And late, you got to remember, ships were, named, were referred as females, except the German Navy. They were he's. So any sailor would say she, so excuse the... Uh, terminology, I don't want to offend anyone, but the torpedo bulges were added here and here and went along, a, along the center section to pr protect the vitals. The vitals were the turrets and machinery. In a battleship Missouri over here, it's called an armor belt. An armor belt is equivalent to the, th to the shell it carries, 16 inch shell, 16 inch armor belt. And the armor belt, no different than the blisters for protecting the vital areas. So they were added to Arizona in her refit. Colorado, as Mike mentioned, was on the west coast in Bremerton getting ref I mean, you mentioned, I'm sorry, uh, you both re referred to it. Colorado was to be next to Arizona, according to what I was reading about, but she was back in Bremerton getting refitted with potato bulges, uh, gun covers for the five inch mounts, and more upgrade. So she missed the uh, being at Pearl Harbor. And let's see, anything else on the ship, the significance. Besides that, she was no, she was um, one of the earlier super dreadnoughts back then. You had the dreadnoughts, then you had the, you had pre-dreadnoughts. Dreadnoughts is named on um, taken from the British dreadnought battleship. And all the ships around were called dreadnoughts or super. And then these ships came out later, Arizona being 608 feet in length, um, were called super dreadnoughts at that time. And then you start building the ships getting bigger. Remember, Arizona was only 31,000 tons. You know, that was heavy for a battleship back in those days. And um, being 608 feet long, if you compare her against Missouri, she's about two-thirds the length of Missouri, less than two-thirds. Missouri is, what, 47, 48,000? In modern time, I think they can kick it up to higher. Yamato was, in, was 68,000 tons. So you can see the difference that the World War II ships were almost twice the size and length. And, and uh, the only thing larger than the Missouri would have been the Yamatos. Um, that pretty much concludes what I wanted to share. There's a short video Mike is going to start, and I'll be available for questions. I hope Any that questions? in the meantime. Yes, sir. Um, didn't they use aircraft, uh, I think, mounted on top of one of the turrets for the catapult for spotting uh, the shells where they last? Yes, they were observation. They, they would actually direct where the shells were splashing? 
Mm -hmm. You're very correct on it. And the aircraft they used uh, were um, Kingfishers. They just transferred from the SOCs. See, back in the Navy days, battleships got the latest and greatest aircraft. So the Kingfishers just happened to come out. My Arizona upstairs is equipped with Kingfishers. The model here has biplanes. So again, we learn how to update our ships. And with the Arizona, with the Kingfishers, you'll see them in there. And they had the old, they were dark, uh, a dark uh, blue with a white underbelly or light gray underbelly. And they still had the meatball in the, for the star. Now, no bars, bars came later. And they had white, red and white tail um, decorations on the tail. You can see them on the PBYs, another Navy aircraft. Those were float planes, right? Float planes. And the crane on the back of the ship is how you pluck them out of the water. To right. The ship, right. Right. And here's the thing, too. Many people wonder, how do they pick up the planes and planes catch up? They would put nets or bamboo um, skirts on the water where the plane would land and taxi up to it. And that's how the air crane would pick them up. And, um, put them on there and then you have these large cranes that will work putting aircraft on top of the turret. Later on they quit doing that. So, Any other questions? Well the one thing I'd just add to that, the experience of having these planes on ships uh, ended up being a big problem once we got into the battles of the Solomon Islands. Our cruisers had the planes, but guess what, if you got a plane what else do you have there? Gasoline, oil, flares, all this stuff. And in our cruisers, they tended to be stored back along in here. Mm -hmm. Well, the first time you took anything of uh, hit back there, what you did, you basically lit up the whole stern section, you know, of your, what happened there? Oh, whoops. Uh, One thing to add, if I may, on, oh. Um, go back to present it as the slideshow. Okay, go ahead. One thing I'd like to add is, um, as you were sharing about the Japanese pilot and how accurate they were in hitting our ships, Japanese pilots spent an average of 10 years training. Do you talk about discipline? They were most experienced because the discipline and training of these pilots was superb. And later on, that experience will come and haunt Japan after the Battle of Midway and subsequent battles because they did not have the capacity to train these pilots. They were lucky just to get a few hours. And then years later on, you hear about the kamikazes. They were barely lucky to get training to get the plane off the ground, but not how to land. So, um, Jerry, yes. Uh, you were talking about the aircraft aboard the ship. Uh, tell us about the source of energy that was used to launch the air airplane off the launching rails. My understanding was, and I haven't done much research, uh, forgive me, but it was like a, a shotgun shell that would be launched to shoot them off the catapult to get them up to speed. Is that correct? Five inch shell? So if you want to get a shock on it and the G-forces, uh, why don't you sit on them? You can sit on one of them. But that was how they got them off because you don't have much of a distance for aircraft to get up to speed. So I don't know which, which is more of a shock, uh, a catapult off a current carrier or a shotgun shot, <laughs> uh, a five-inch shot. So you had a question, yeah, sir. You mentioned the USS Kidd. It's a museum ship. Baton Rouge. In Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And the Cassin Young belongs to the National Park Service. And it's up in Boston at the former Boston Navy Yard. I was on the kid, and I never got to see the kid, go to the kid, but I was on Cass and Young, and I have a habit of wandering around ships and getting into gun turrets. <laughs> I got caught in the Cass and Young on the aft turret, playing in the gun turret. Girlfriend was getting kicked off the Constitution, by the way, <laughs> and I was being kicked off kid, I mean uh, Cass and Young, because I had that turret turning, and I had the barrel fully uh, air up in the air, and back in those days, someone goes, what are you doing? Oh, watching for Japs. And he goes, well, you won't find any Japs here. So I had to crawl out of the ship. Another side note, I got locked in the engine room with the Queen Mary. Try to do that, and there's no ghosts on the Queen Mary. <laughs> the, other, the other comment I would make, uh, I don't 
don't have any experience recovering aircraft from a ship, but the motor whaleboat is going up and down like this and trying to catch a hook from the crane to lift an airplane or a, a motor whaleboat out of the water to catch it. That's not an easy task. There's a lot of photos of a pilot hanging over there and trying to get that hook onto his aircraft. But I think having that skid in the back. The skid helped him. Things out just a bit. Because a ship would come around, if they had to smooth the water out for the float planes. So the ship is sailing this way. She would pull a turn, either port or starboard, to smooth the water out just before the to get the mat down and the plane can float up to it because they wanted to smooth the water so to avoid this up and down business. <laughs> Any other questions? Mike has a short video he wants to show and I thank you very much. I'll be around for any questions.
Yeah, which real quickly was just another one of the ones we were lucky was not hit, right? No, actually, uh, I'm Jim Mize. I'm one of the uh, volunteers here at the museum. And uh, I wanted to mention something about Station Hypo and also uh, the underground aircraft factory 